like to invite Alex Silverman up from the Big Nerd Ranch, who's actually here all week doing a course uh, down on St Kilda Road. Uh, I don't know whether you, uh, who's actually got the Aaron Hillgas book. Hands up. A good number of you. I think, uh, like you guys, I sort of actually got back into iOS development using the uh, the yellow one, the Mac OS 10 book. Um, but uh, these guys are definitely one of the best known um, training companies going around, and it's actually really exciting to see that they're prepared to come all the way over here to uh, to put on one of these training courses. So hopefully they'll be out here a little bit more often. And um, you know, if you have other people that you need to get trained up or uh, you know do some um, yeah do some training, basically get in contact with these guys and uh, and let them know because I think. If you guys can kind of see that there's a lot more demand here, you might be coming up a little bit more often. And I think they have some giveaways as well. Yeah, at the end I have some books to uh, give away. My, my boss sent me down with extra books just in case your customs uh, held up the books for the class that we shipped here. So I don't want to lug these back to Atlanta. So. All right, um, here's the agenda. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, tell you about Big Nerd Ranch, just in case you don't know anything about Big Nerd Ranch. And then uh, I have a few quick topics, uh, it's not a very technical talk, a few quick topics that come up during uh, the, the week at our course. I want to do a show and tell of one of the apps, the last app I did, a uh, sales pitch for a little Mac uh, dev tool that I've done, and then the trivia at the end. My name is Alex Silverman. I'm a, mostly a consultant at the Big Nerd Ranch. I do about eight classes a year. Uh, it's really awesome to get to travel to Australia. This is our first class here, so we're hoping to uh, start up a regular iOS boot camp here. I've done about over a dozen stores in the App Store now, um, 300,000 downloads. But lately, I've been doing uh, internal apps for Parker & Gamble. They're my large uh, enterprise client. So Parker & Gamble has really been buying up iPads for their employees, and they've hired us, uh, as well as other app shops, to do a lot of internal app development uh, to solve very specific problems. Let me showcase a couple of these. This was like the first big app, the first big success I had in the App Store. So you guys don't have, Tivana is a specialty tea retailer in the US. Uh, they have some stores in Mexico and they're branching out to Europe. Uh, no stores in Australia yet, so you guys probably have not heard of them unless you've traveled to the US. Uh, but this, this app came out great, worked with their designer. It's, uh, you can browse their teas. There's a tea blender, store locator, tea timer, uh, OpenGL driven all the basic things you would expect, but this is obviously a lot of business for us, as I'd imagine for you all here, just these corporate branding apps, just because the cost of development, you know, the cost per impression uh, ends up being about the same as what you pay Google for a click, if not cheaper, so uh, why not build an app? So uh, th this is definitely keeping Big Nerd Ranch busy at the moment. And then the last uh, large uh, consumer-facing app that I did was uh, a point-of-sales system. So this is a merchant services company also based out of Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, they approached us. Uh, we use the same, well, we support multiple hardware cradles now. Um, but the original cradle was the same one that they used in the Apple Store, at least in the US. I don't know if they use that same hardware cradle here. So this was uh, the longest standing iPhone project I worked on. It worked on it about a year before 1.0 came out. Uh, their programmers were working on the web service. Our relationship with them now ended. They hired a, an internal developer to take over the maintenance of that, but I brought it to uh, at least version 1.0 and it's out in the App Store. And then a little bit about Big New Ranch. It sounds like everyone's, uh, everyone knows Aaron. Uh, if you went to WWDC, he's hard to miss. Very tall, wearing his cowboy hat. So uh, we just turned 10 years old. Um, I first worked for Aaron back when I was in school and then um, uh, I actually quit on him to go teach high school uh, physics and then came back uh, about two and a half years ago now. So uh, it's, he's been a great boss. So we, we, as you know, we do uh, training the books um, and consulting. Consulting is now actually the bigger arm of the company. So the, the books and the classes are more actually to sell our consulting services. And we're just starting to get into products um, as a lot of consultancies end up doing. We have several books on the market. We have the, the Cocoa book that most of you probably know, the iPhone programming book, which I'll give out. Um, there's a Cocoa 2 book coming out, advanced book that we did with Mark Dalrymple from Google. Um, there's an Objective-C book that Aaron just wrote that he's hoping to, uh, Stephen Cochan's book, to uh, give some competition to that. We have a Django book and an Android book and, and others. So um, definitely a large series of books in the works. Uh, client list is growing. Um, PMG is my big client. Uh, we're doing some stuff with AT&T, Pearson, other clients. Let me tell you a little bit about the ranch. So this is historic Banning Mills where we do our classes in Atlanta. So the whole idea of Big Nerd Ranch is just to get away from your environment for a week and uh, 
come learn how to program, uh, learn something new. So the ranch is a lot of fun. It's out about an hour from the Atlanta airport. Uh, one of the reasons Aaron uh, situated Big Nerd Ranch in Atlanta is because it is the world's busiest airport now. So a lot of cheap direct flights, uh, at least for people in the western part of the world and the northern hemisphere. Um, it is a lot of fun. Uh, there's zip lines. Every room's got a jacuzzi tub. There's rivers out back. Um, the idea is, I mean, all you could just buy this book and go through it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. Well, I mean, everyone here's a programmer. Um, watch the free classes from Stanford. So the idea is we're selling an experience to have fun while you learn how to program. And not all the classes are done by Big Nerd Ranch employees. I, I'm full-time Big Nerd Ranch employee, but a lot of people who also have written their own books come in and teach their book as a class. And the exciting news is, uh, this has been in the works for, for over two years now, but we are very close to actually breaking ground on our own building. So we will actually have the ranch. Um, right now we do about 30 classes a year at the other facility that we rent. Uh, we're hoping to up that a little bit. And then those other weeks that we don't have classes, we would like to rent the facility out to corporations who want to do corporate retreats or other people who want to host their own classes. So the financing is in place. Uh, as many of you know, the, the real estate market in the US is not doing so well right now. So it was a big headache to actually get the, the loan there, you know, because the piece of property is pretty far from the city. So other than the building itself and the classes, it, you know, the, the banks were very skittish. But we got the collateral, and we're, we're ready to build. So look, look for that in about a year from now. All right, let me switch gears here. That's my uh, advertisement. A couple topics from the, the boot camp that come up. Um, this is one interesting thing that I like to, to point out uh, to quiz people. The answer is on the right, but if you just look at the left to start, um, a lot of these are just like newbie mistakes I often see when, uh, especially because most of the people that take our class, um, you know, it's targeted towards someone who's done object oriented programming, some C programming, but new to Objective C. So most of you, you know, probably above the, the target audience. But a lot of people that take the class, uh, when they come in, they make kind of you know, the same mistakes over and over again. So I, I try to make little example snippets. So this is one just talking about uh, the Boolean. Um, it is a signed char, and yes is defined as 1, and no is defined as 0, as you would expect. But uh, I often see people try to compare a Boolean to yes or no. But because it is a signed char, it can be more than just 0 and 1. Um, I also see them try to store a, a Boolean variable and then test the conditional. So you get these situations where, yes, if you test assign 255 to bool, it, it will pass, but not 256 because that will overflow into the next byte, and then that results in a zero. So I uh, always try to point out that you should never be uh, equating a Boolean to yes or no because it can be more than yes or no, and that's not probably the conditional that you're thinking of. So just put the conditional directly in your parentheses, and then also... Um, to not store it intermediately like this as well. Also, uh, I find that a lot of the new programmers to iOS don't take advantage of the responder chains, specifically the fact that UI view controller is a subclass of UI responder. So one of the uh, early issues in our exercises is about the fourth chapter in, we do an exercise um, with MapKit, and then there's a text field that's put on the screen, and the keyboard doesn't disappear when they click off the keyboard, as you know, since you have to call resign first responder. So they usually get frustrated, and you know, one way to do this is you know, to set the delegate and respond to the message and close it. But I think a, a better solution is to actually subclass UI view controller. So this is a, a subclass of UI view controller that I use in my library. And in that subclass, to actually keep a pointer to whatever is the current first responder. And because UI view controller is in the responder chain, if the, its view or those subviews don't respond to that touch, eventually the touch will come to the view controller. And then you can, uh, in my uh, property there, I actually call resign first responder. Uh, I close the keyboard there. So because I use this view controller in all my work, I get this behavior for free, and I don't have to keep retyping the same glue code. So that's, again, another mistake, I've, or I don't want to call it a mistake, just a uh, thing that new iOS developers tend to miss is that uh, UI view controller is part of the responder chain. Another quick tip is um, in the book, if you've gone through it, uh, Joe, the author, uh, will we'll state that you should always use non-atomic properties. So we got this question uh, for our uh, BNR, Ask BNR blog that we were doing temporarily about 
Um, this person read on a different blog, if you read it, that you know, atomic properties make your app thread safe, so why are you telling us to do this non-atomic? The performance overhead is small. So I decided to answer that question. With a, this is not a very scientific test, I, I know, please don't tear this apart, but uh, I decided to just create a test object with a non-atomic property and an atomic property and actually test uh, a million accesses and see what the performance difference was and then try to explain exactly what atomic properties means to this person. And the test was again very simple, just uh, one non-atomic property, one atomic property. I just iterated a million times uh, for each of them and took a time difference. And the results uh, were as expected. I assumed that the atomic property would take longer to access over and over again because of the lock that is implicit with that property. Um, so about five times longer on the iPhone. Now, that's a million accesses. Five times longer sounds scary, but that's, you know, we're talking four tenths of a second, which is in human time, you, you know, your user is not going to see that. So why don't we just use atomic properties everywhere? And really, the answer is it doesn't matter if people like to use atomic properties. Right? The point of atomic properties, uh, if you read Apple's documentation, is the, the assembly that gets com or synthesized at compilation, if you synthesize the atomic property, is about equivalent to that code, they say. Um, so it does two things. A, it locks it, so you can't set it and get it in an inconsistent state if two threads are accessing the same property. But also the retain and auto release is rather handy. So if one thread comes out from under and nullifies that property, uh, you're not going to have a dangling pointer because that object was released from memory. So in that case, uh, atomic properties are, are good. But the other use case, I, I tried to diagram this the best I could. Um, so if we have two threads accessing the same property, I don't really consider that thread safe. Uh, it depends what you consider thread safety to mean. Because what if you had one thread accessing a property, another thread immediately after nullifies it, and then the first thread does something with that object and then sets it back. What is the proper state of that? So you still have some type of race condition there. So in general, uh, we stick with non-atomic properties unless it's absolutely necessary, uh, just, just because, I mean, even if it's a tenth of a second, why not get that performance? And I would argue that you know, atomic properties doesn't equal thread safety uh, because you could still have some type of inconsistent state of your data. So when I'm designing applications that are using multiple threads, I try to encapsulate or design my data model in a way that I will never have two threads accessing the same part of the data model. So if you design your app that way, where different sections of the data are being accessed by different threads, you're never going to have this issue of inconsistent data anyways, and then the atomic versus non-atomic argument is not even a problem. All right, and my sales pitch. Uh, there's nothing pretty, but I think if anyone would want to buy this, it would be you all. So this is a, my only Mac app store, a Mac app in the app store um, called Dev Profiles. So I work with a lot of different clients in the same day. Uh, not only do I work with a lot of different clients the same day, but I have different developer accounts that I sign apps depending on who I'm distributing it to or if it's internal. And I like to leave my signing settings on the generic ones, and then I like to swap in and out my certificates and my keychain and my provisioning profiles uh, depending on which one I have to sign instead of changing those build settings over and over again. So all I wrote is a very, very simple Mac app where you can make a profile and it manages your keychain and the folder where the provisioning profiles go. So you can just swap in and out your profiles very quickly. Um, thankfully, uh, I got very scared because Xcode 3 uh, would re read in those changes after it was open. So I could swap out the keychain and Xcode 3 saw that. The first version of Xcode 4, you had to restart Xcode. So I was like, oh, no one's going to buy this if they have to restart Xcode over and over again. Of course, no one's buying this anyways. <laughs> um, <laughs> but with Xcode 4, the, I forget what version they fixed that. It does uh, read the keychain data in um, when, when it's changed. So um, $1.99, I know you could write this in a day, but if you want to save some time, there you go. The keychain API is not easy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, time for some trivia. Uh, let's just... Raise your hand, and I'll see if I can figure out who raised their hand first. They're not very hard questions. Back. Yes, that is correct. All right, well, a, a, a book, or I have one shirt and a flashlight. The book? Okay. Can you pass that back for me? 
Yeah, so that was pretty exciting. <laughs> of course, I'm over here while like the economy at home is, you know, tank. Of course, the whole world's stock market went down. Uh, all right, next one. Nope. Yes. I knew someone was going to know. I didn't know that. I had to look that up. <laughs> yeah. Confess it. All right. Next one, maybe the hardest. Yes? I actually don't know. I'd have to look at the documentation. <laughs> I have one in mind. Does anyone uh, want to look that up? I don't think so. If I'm wrong, I'll ship you a book. I would actually, you know, if no one else gets it, you still get a book because no one else tried. Yeah. Okay. It's NSURL connection. Okay. This is right from the documentation. And the reason I, I, like point, I always try to point this out in the class too, because this killed me. So I, I wrote a wrapper on top of NSURL connection since I didn't uh, feel it was sufficient. I don't know if you guys, well, what is that other one? That ASI, H, uh, I don't know if you guys, anyone's using that. So I wrote something similar to that. Although, I wrote it on top of NSURL connection. I didn't go down to sockets like uh, that developer did. Um, yeah, this killed me because, you know, that breaks all the paradigms in any other thing. Um, so I was getting these random crashes that, you know, took me a while to, to realize that the, the object that initiated the NSURL connection was being deallocated. And then when NSURL connection was calling that delegate, uh, I was getting a bunch of crashes. So um, anyways, book or shirt? <laughs> That's the only one I know of, but if I'm wrong, uh, I, I, will, I will make it up to you. Well, you got the book, yet, or the shirt, anyways. Um, all right, last one. Oh, man, I thought someone would get this one. Yes? Uh, Jaguar? No. <laughs> Panther was not first. Okay, we'll keep going. You got to do them all. That's it. Thank you. Many thanks to Alex Silverman for presenting this month. You can learn more about Alex and Big Nerd Ranch at bignerdranch.com. Thanks also to Intunity for hosting this month's event. If you would like to know more about Melbourne Cocoa Heads, visit us on the web at melbournecocoaheads.com or follow Melbourne Cocoa on Twitter.